This is Mark Brzezanski. I'm your host for Mideast Realities, and I want to welcome you to another program. We're in Cairo, Egypt. Cairo, a, one of the greatest and most important countries here in the Middle East, the largest of the Arab countries, and the first Arab country that in fact made a peace with Israel back in 1978. I first came here myself in 1971 as a student. The Russians were still here. Cab rides were six piasters, uh, six tenths of a pound. They are now between five and ten pounds for Westerners. I then came here some years later. It was 1978. I was then a young journalist. I had just published a book for Congressional Quarterly called uh, The U.S. Israel Oil in the Middle East. And in fact, I was invited for three weeks to be a guest of the Egyptian government. I was hosted at the time um, by the Ministry of Information. And um, I was at the Sheraton Hotel, one of the luxury hotels that have uh, been built in recent years. We're at the moment on the rooftop garden of the Carlton Hotel, which was the first hotel that I stayed in when I was a student, at the time hosted by the UN Association of Egypt. I came here as the representative of the International Student Movement for the UN. As I said, at that time the Russians were here. War with Israel was in the air. Um, the idea of a Jewish American coming here was quite unheard of. In fact, I told everyone I was a Unitarian. And since that time, I've probably been to Egypt about a hundred times. A lot has changed, a lot has stayed the same. The situation politically um, is quite different. The situation culturally and economically, in some ways different, in some ways very much the same. Um, we're going to be joined by Mohammed Sid Ahmed, one of the leading Egyptian political commentators, in fact, one of the leading Arab world uh, political commentators. He's a writer for Al Ahram, the uh, largest newspaper here, the New York Times, if you will, of Egypt. And he's an old friend, going back, in fact, to uh, my uh, second visit in 1978. I joined him, um, his wife Mesa, in a small group on New Year's Eve, the day I arrived here in Egypt. And at midnight, over smoked salmon, caviar, and uh, European champagne, we began discussing the affairs of this region. I think you'll find Mohammed Sid Ahmed an extremely illuminating personality, an extremely insightful man. And in fact, uh, you should know that in 1973, he wrote the book When the Guns Fall Silent which was the first time a major Arab uh, personality wrote about the possibility of peace with Israel. This peace that has come about, Camp David, and more recently the Oslo Agreements, the Israeli PLO Agreements, are not what Mohammed Sid Ahmed had in mind. He, I'm sure, will find uh, much to criticize and much to explain in these understandings. So, once again, welcome to Mideast Realities. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll find this program as interesting as I have always found Mohammed Sid Ahmed. Mohammed Sid Ahmed, uh, a friend of mine for many years, going back to the 70s, in fact, when you were my age, and now I'm your age. Um, and we're going to be discussing the realities of the situation in the Middle East, the realities of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, accommodation, the realities of what's happening here in Egypt and North Africa and throughout the Arab world. And we could have no better person to join us than Mohammed Sid Ahmed, who's well known throughout this region and, in fact, in the States as one of the premier uh, political analysts uh, of the events of this part of the world. Mohammed, thank you for joining us. Hello. You and I first met a few years after you had written a book called When the Guns Fall Silent. At the time, the guns were rather noisy, and the idea of talking about the guns falling silent was uh, heretical. Now the guns have fall fallen silent, at least the guns that Between I think states. you were referring to. That's right. The guns other Between guns. States. Other the guns. The situation has changed now. The situation has changed I a mean, lot. We have not gone beyond the process yet, I think. The process is still that of conflict in the region. I know that the United States is very keen on the idea that peace is there, already there. I think that when uh, President Clinton 
came for the first time as president to the Middle East a short time ago, his message was, now the frame of reference should be peace. And it is time for war on those which are perceived as the enemies of peace. In other words, peace and terrorism cannot be compatible. Arafat, for example, should take a very staunch stand towards Hamas because the Hamas people are terrorists. Egypt should take a very staunch stand towards Gaddafi because he's identified with terrorism. And of course, that has become, I think, for the United States, the frame of reference. In the region here, issues are much more complex. One would be questioning whether we are really having a situation of peace, because it will be difficult to have peace if there is not a minimum of parity between the parties, if there is not the feeling that or it is not clear whether it's been a situation where all are getting something out of it or that some are getting it are getting something right. out of it rather than the others. Let's get to specifics. Yasser Arafat, the Israelis, you were one of those who talked about two states a long time ago. You were one of those who talked about an accommodation with Israel. Let's be very clear what your attitude is. What has happened? Have the Palestinians surrendered? Is there a deal that makes sense? Do you consider this a major step on the road to peace? Or do you consider it an Israeli victory? Well, yes, you know. of course. Now, this is a complicated issue, but I'll try to begin by not being categorical in any definite direction and finish up with a conclusion. But to begin with, now, what is the frame of reference? What is the frame of reference? Possibly the PLO after the end of the Cold War, after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, was not really backed by anybody, all the more so after the Gulf crisis. Now, uh, what, I mean, when you come to an issue of peace, how to measure the extent to which you could have done better or you couldn't have? Arafat could eventually say, given the situation in which I was, I would have not got anything easier. It's easy to talk to ourselves and define what our conditions are, but it's difficult to have them implemented when you are in a negotiation process and that something has to be implemented and it depends on the balance of power. But others could also say that actually the Palestinians inter Palestinian rift was an important factor in determining the conditions of Palestinian peace with Israel. In a certain way, Madrid began not with the PLO, but with leaders of the Palestinians from within the occupied territories and from within a situation where an intifada had been important for over five years. All right, but Mohammed, you're going back this is for American television, it's Mideast realities. Rather than go into the, the whole framework and the whole details, what's the final conclusion? You know my view, for no, instance, my, no, that this my, looks my, more my like surrender. Conclusion. No, my final conclusion, yes, yeah, yeah, right. My final conclusion is that it's not, a, it's not a peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It is a diktat situation. It is, it, there is no guarantee that it will ever achieve the self-determination of the Palestinians. The opposite is rather the most expected. And at this juncture, one cannot talk of an agreement of peace that enjoys uh, a consensus amongst Palestinians. The opposite is much closer to the truth. And if the opposite becomes, in fact, the reality, if a year or two from now, we look at the situation and we say, what we thought was most likely has in fact happened. There is no equity, there is no Palestinian state, there, there's a variety of reservations, and one party dictated to the other the terms of the understanding. How will that impact, in your view, on the affairs of this region? Look, there is no fatality since the end of the Cold War that there will be peace in the Middle East. Peace is one possible option, but it needs uh, uh, it needs 
a, 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 I mean, it needs a meaningful uh, action in order to achieve it. What are the Otherwise other you can have chaos. What are, are the other options? Down. What are the other options? Yes, well, the, uh, another option is a new Israeli game, a new form of Israeli hegemony over the region. I mean, to put it very simply, what, what, what the Israeli government is now doing is to distort in a certain way the 242 resolution. 242 resolution talks of land for peace. Now we are talking of land for a Middle East market, actually. Peace is identified with the Middle East market. In other words, instead of Israel ensuring its security by means of occupied Arab territory, it is ensuring it by planting an economic presence all over the Arab world, business relations that guarantees a presence within the Arab communities and constitutes a guarantee for its security, not because it will be a mutual benefit for all, but it's first and but first and and before anything else as a guarantee of security for Israel. But it's not just security for Israel. Isn't it also security for the Hashemite regime, security for the Saudi regime, in a security way. for your yes. regime, which yes. is not very popular here in Egypt? Yes. Isn't well, that what this deal is all about? Yes, well, Consolidating the hold of these regimes on the region? Yes, in a certain way one could say that what has happened is a displacement of the contradictions of the area, not their elimination, not their overcoming. Instead of having contradictions between Arabs and Israelis, and that was called a non-a war situation, now we have a peace situation where eventually Israel is playing the game of uh, attracting one uh, Arab party after the other into its own game, presenting it as if the contradictions have been overcome and displacing the contradictions into the Arab societies themselves, between the rulers and the peoples, between a situation where Israel appeals to regimes in order that they become, that eventually become part of the North, in the new North-South confrontation, while the the, the, the bulk of the Arab peoples are left out in the cold, out in the south. And doesn't that then bring about further polarization and further radicalization it, uh, in these societies? Polarization, radicalization, and of course instability and no peace. So what we're talking about then, if I understand you, what you're saying, as opposed to what, what, what I've said before when we had lunch, while this is promoted as peace, and while the President of the United States comes here and talks about peace, the reality is that certain classes and certain political regimes are benefiting from this, but the people themselves are disenchanted, frustrated. Your own wife used the phrase when I got here on the first day, we've been had. Now, she never really explained herself. I guess I just sort of well, assumed probably, that well, I... That more or less something of this sort. But what I mean to say is... What does we've you, been had mean? Yes, well, <laughs> they've got us. They, they've trapped us. And who's they? They is the Americans and the Israelis. Plus? And, yes, and perhaps <laughs> also the establishment all over the region. There is no doubt about that. I mean, what we do have at this junction is a situation where... Uh, it's all right, please. What we do have all over the region is a situation where uh, it's a typical, I think, situation of the north-south dilemma. I mean, since the Cold War, this, the, 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 since the New World Order, the so-called New World Order, since then the assumption was that we didn't, we had overcome bipolarity. Bipolarity was east-west and it's overcome. Now we know it's not true. Bipolarity is otherwise, it's north-south. And in the Arab-Israeli conflict too, it's a north-south issue. The difference now, between now and before, is that the assumption was that the north was Israel and the rest was rather part of the south. Now in the name of peace, that Israel and many of the regimes throughout the region become an integrated north or an integrated part that would dream to become part of the north, while on the other hand, the bulk of the populations of the area are left out in the cold. My name, is Mark, my name is Mark Brzezanski. You're listening, uh, you're watching Mideast Realities.
And we're here in Cairo, Egypt, on the roof garden of the Carlton Hotel in downtown Egypt with Mohammed Said Ahmed, one of the premier political analysts uh, of the affairs of this part of the world, who happens also to be a longtime friend of mine. You mentioned the New World Order, uh, Mohammed, a phrase that uh, George Bush brought forward uh, to help explain what we were doing by destroying uh, uh, Iraq just a few years ago. Now, that war with Iraq has had ramifications that most Americans don't understand. You as an Egyptian intellectual, as an Arab intellectual, looking back on that war, which led to Madrid, which led to the agreements, and which of course is still polarizing this region. You still can't have an Arab summit meeting because the, the, the Arab countries are too divided. Can you try to put this quickly into a perspective that Americans can understand? What has happened here and what was that war all about? Was it really about Kuwait and the Emir? No, it was about uh, it was about Kuwait insofar as uh, Kuwait is a rich oil country. It was uh, Mainly, you see, I think that there was an initial problem in it. And then how America took advantage of that initial problem. There has always been divisions within the Arab nation and in the Arab world. One of them is a division I call between the yellow and the green. The green is a cultivated part of the Arab land. It is the part around Israel. It is the part where there has been confrontation and conflict for a long time. It's the part where there's been the Central Arab countries. Then there was the yellow, that's the desert where oil was discovered, or most of the oil is. And as such, the part confronting Israel got exhausted, while the part far away, green, the yellow, became rich. This has created a, a, a permanent problem throughout the Arab world, between Arab regimes. In a certain way, the issue of Kuwait and after the war between Iraq and Iran, after Iraq's exhaustion and its will to project itself as a victorious, as the victorious party in that war, out of this came this attempt at invading Kuwait. Of course, certain historical issues could be brought up about this, but anyhow, irrespective, invading Kuwait. And of course, America took advantage of the situation, number one. And didn't the Israelis and the Americans jointly take advantage of it? I mean, well, isn't this a war? Well, first of all, the, it's a global issue first that the Israelis helped. But uh, the global issue is that oil in the Gulf area is not authorized to be vulnerable. It has to be taken care of by the superpowers and by America, first of all. And America knew very well that in the post-bipolar world, in a multi polar world of tomorrow, if Europe becomes an entity, if Japan becomes an entry, oil is a very important key for a long time to come. So much will depend upon the country that holds the area. So as such, the Americans looked for legitimacy to intervene in this war. In a certain way, Egypt offered them this, this legitimacy. And why did Egypt do that? Why did Egypt do that? Because, first of all, Egypt was against Iraq on that issue. Egypt does not want a conflict with the Arab oil-rich countries uh, 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 and, on, and, uh, and Egypt since a long time, since its peace treaty with Israel, uh, has always uh, adopted a policy that was within the general American outlook to what the world should yeah, be. But, but at the end of the day, after all the explanations, after all the hubbub, after all the diplomatic statements, yes. Didn't Hosni Mubarak and his government do what they did by legitimizing the American-Israeli war to destroy Baghdad and Not Iraq? Exactly. No. Didn't, didn't they do it because, number one, this government is dependent on the United States to stay in power? Dependent on Amer no. Dependent that this government is strongly linked to the United States, that this government is dependent on the United States for a lot of things, yes. Okay, you phrase but, it slightly differently, yes. fine. No, I don't phrase it, I'm not phrasing it differently, but it is wrong to say that this country or this leadership wanted the destruction of Baghdad. Well, if they didn't want it, they sure contributed to it. No, they did not contribute to that part of the war, and in a certain way, even Bush didn't want to take over Baghdad because he was interested in having Saddam remain in power because he wanted, he didn't want... Uh, 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 I, said, didn't, I said nothing about the takeover of Baghdad. I said about the destruction of Iraqi power and influence. Absolutely. Destruction of, uh, of Iraqi power, absolutely. And the main party that wanted that was Israel. The main party that wanted... Uh, look, I mean, no, 
doubt that Israel wants the destruction of Iraq and the destruction of Iran and the destruction of any recalcitrant Arab parties against Israel in the region and any that is that is that is obvious but where did Egypt stand? Egypt understands that the breakdown of uh, Iraq and a dismantling of Iraq could expose Arab the whole Arab area to the Iranians and to the Islamic upsurge much more. Fair enough. So you stop short. You defang Iraq. You take away Iraq before the war. Was the premier Arab power here on the rise no, culturally, no, economically, no, no. after Egypt? No. No, no, not no after because Egypt? it had been exhausted by 10 years of war with Iran. It was a totally exhausted country at that juncture. And one reason why it had to go to, into Kuwait was to grab Kuwait's money. So the issue is, it is not true that Iraq was a rising star. Well, to grab e and Kuwait's actually, money, and except actually, that the Kuwaitis and the Saudis had been encouraging the Iraqis to attack Iran. No, not And had been promising they were going to finance the war. For, uh, the, the war against Iran, with, when Iran... Ah, yes, of course, they financed the war against Iran quite a bit. And then after And that, they promised much more. And they promised all the, kinds of help As long as the war Iran. was against Iran, not <laughs> against Kuwait. Yes. Because against Kuwait is against themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these countries that, look, you see, I mean... But my point is, is in, at the end of the day, it gets yes. very convoluted. Aren't we dealing with a region that is being manipulated by the Americans and derivatively by the Israelis, keeping the Arab parties fighting each other, keeping one group Absolutely. against another? Absolutely. I mean, when it comes to that, well, I'd say, I said it a moment ago, I said what we have witnessed is not a, an elimination of the contradictions of the region, it is a displacement of this country. The most acute contradiction in the region now are between the Arabs themselves. Not only Arab peoples and Arab regimes, but even Arab regimes. All, I mean, the peace process has been the elimination of contradictions between the Arab regimes and Israel into becoming contradictions with the Arab world itself. Even if there are contradictions inside the Israeli society, and there are, but one way to have these contradictions overcome inside Israel is to make them all the deeper on the other side. So there is no question of a peace process here. It's not a question of coming to a situation where peace is meant to project the idea of harmony, the idea of overcoming contradictions. On the contrary, we are having them displaced from one place into another, even as a means to overcome the contradictions when it comes to Israel or between Israelis and other Western powers, etc. And does this begin to explain what's happening in North Africa? where you have an Islamic revolution that seems about to take power in Algeria. And even in the few days that I'm here, um, 11 police were, were killed through Islamic uh, hit squads and assassination squads in Upper Egypt. You've, you've got security in Egypt that's much tighter and much different than what I used to experience 10, 12 years ago when I came No, here. there is no doubt that now there is a challenge to all Arab societies coming out of the movement uh, which uh, attributes itself to religion, but I would attribute it rather to a form of ideology. The issue being that secular ideologies are broken down, socialism is broken down, pan-Arabism is broken down, as secular ideologies for the Arabs by which they stood up to Israel. So this radical variant of Islam has taken over instead as an expression of dissent and as an expression of a way of saying no. So this is true for all over the region. Of course, the situation in Algeria is not exactly the situation in Egypt. Algeria has not had a state for a long, for a long time in its history. Egypt has had the oldest state on earth. Uh, is what you're saying that these political agreements with the Israelis and with the Americans, the war against uh, Iraq, that all of this has humiliated many people in this part of the world, made them ashamed of their own governments, ashamed of what's happened to them, and the reaction in some cases takes the form of Islamic nationalism. Yes, if you like. I mean, what, uh, what is actually happening now, the peace has not created what the objective of peace was. It is not a situation where everybody gets something out. It is not an improved for situation for everybody. It's an improved situation for Israel. It is not, perhaps not all Israelis are aware of it. There's still there are critics of the peace process in Israel itself. But grosso modo, Israel now has linkages with most of Arab countries. It's no longer in a 
Middle East ghetto. It is just the opposite. It is today, it could, it could project the image that it has never been as victorious as it has become. Uh, the Arabs are told that they're not defeated, but they feel that they are. It is only those with vested interests in projecting the image that they are not defeated that would say so.